Hello there, Evie here. Welcome to a review of the Colink Satellite. Now, you can't see a very good picture of it so far because trying to get both of us in shot is a little tricky, so we'll fix that for you now. So, this review, we're going to start off with a little bit, bit of a chat first about the title of the video uh, and why it's laid out the way it is, uh, which might seem odd to you because it might look quite normal, but it's been specifically uh, tuned so it's not quite as it should be, sort of. Um, so, uh, looking past that though, we'll be going over an overview of the case, the chassis, breaking it all down and just looking at the individual components as they stand without a system in there. Uh, then we'll look at a build, we'll put a build in, we'll put our test system in, uh, which consists of an i7-6700K, uh, L9i cooler, uh, a motherboard that's been set up identically to the other motherboards I use for different sizes, and yeah, a GTX 1070 for the Win Edition graphics card, and a pile of drives. Um, you'll see that in the, in the build though during the video. Uh, we also do a little bit of testing, I say a little bit of testing, we're actually doing about 10 minutes worth of commentary on the testing because it, it's quite interesting to see how um, different configurations of the fan, of the case fan that comes with it and putting in uh, an extra fast fan instead uh, will change the outcome and will benefit it or not uh, in certain circumstances so it's nice to discuss those sorts of things to give you a good idea of what, what is worth spending money on. I mean the case is only worth uh, 25 to 30 pounds by itself so if you've got to spend an extra 15 pounds on a nice quiet uh, and high speed fan or something like that, uh, is it worth doing? We'll work that out uh, and then we'll go into the b-roll and the conclusion after that if you want my absolute thoughts breakdowns of pros cons and mixed opinions i make lots of notes just so i can give you uh, my final opinion on the whole case look to the end of the video and we'll discuss that so onto the note of the video title why i've named it what it is so it's named colink satellite mini itx slash micro atx review uh, why it's named like that why it's so weird well normally you wouldn't put in two compatibility standards into a title or at least i wouldn't uh, let's say with a cooler Master, Masterbox uh, Q300L, I didn't put in Cooler Master, Masterbox Q300L, Micro ATX slash Mini ITX review because it's assumed that the lowest or the smaller standards can fit in. Once you've uh, labeled the, the larger standard, say with an ATX case, you don't have to say ATX and Micro ATX and ITX because it's just assumed it'll all fit. But this case is predominantly marketed as a Micro ATX case and there's very little mentioned about Mini ITX when it comes to the, the core marketing or the core sales page and things like that of this case. So why I would say that this is barely a micro ATX case and it should be predominantly marketed as marketed as a mini ITX case. Well first things first, uh, the majority of micro ATX boards don't fit in this case. This case can support a maximum size of 226mm tall by 180mm wide. That's its maximum official supported size. Uh, and there are a few weird anomalies with that. But with a board like that for a start, uh, you don't get dual graphics card support, and more on that in a second. Uh, so you won't be able to get 216x slots in there, or 216x um, rails, because it just won't support it. The max you'll get is a single uh, rail that is a 16x rail, and then 2x4 rails, uh, which is pretty much, or slots, which which is pretty much the uh, the standard for boards of that size. Plus, going on from that then, uh, when you have a 226mm tall board, well, you know, how many standoffs do you support that? Well, normally six, and pretty much in every case, I haven't seen one yet uh, of that size, where you don't need six standoffs. So this will only support four, which are the four predominant ones for mini ITX motherboards. So it doesn't even have the six that would support the motherboard uh, standard that it, or the maximum motherboard standard, micro ATX standard, that it can support. So that's a huge issue there. Moving on from that, there are only two PCI Express slots to the rear so they're going on from the point that uh, you can at maximum on those board sizes on that size of micro ATX board you can have a 16x slot and 2x4 slots you wouldn't even be able to occupy all of those you'd be stuck with just uh, a two slot graphics card and that's it you wouldn't be able to utilize one of the single slots or the single 4, 4x slots uh, it just wouldn't be possible or you can go with a 16x card, which is uh, one slot thick, and then go with a, a buy four uh, expansion card or something, which, you know, for the, this style of case might be worth it. Um, but in my opinion, it doesn't really work out so well. So those are my like, those are my core arguments for why uh, initially you need to go into this review and you need to look at this case as predominantly a mini ITX case. So just going back to those, it won't support most cases. Well, I actually did a roundup of all the cases, all the micro ATX cases being sold for the last three generations from both uh, Intel's LG, uh, LGA1151 socket and all of the AM4 sockets available. And out of the 119 motherboards I came across being sold in the UK, but it'll be similar for other markets, you can only fit in 18 of those into this case. Only 18 of 119 
boards will fit in this case. Micro ATX boards, by the way. Every every mini ATX board will fit in here. But yeah, the uh, Micro ATX ones will fit in here. 18 of 119. That's just over 15% of the market of Micro ATX motherboards can fit in this case. And frankly, that's appalling. And what's even worse than that is how many of those are high-performance boards? Well, from what I saw, I think one or two uh, are Z-series boards for the LGA. Uh, and how many of those are available for AM4? Three, and they're all ASUS Prime X uh, Prime K boards. Um, so yeah, so you've got a choice of three for your uh, for your Ryzen builds and things like that. Uh, and you've got um, if you want a performance system in here, you've got a choice of maybe one or two boards. But with every mini ITX board you have, or that is that can go into here, which is all of them, you have your full range of uh, Zs, uh, your Zs, uh, Z series boards, your Bs, your Qs, uh, and you know all the way through the X boards as well for the Ryzen system. So there we go. Anyway, that's pretty much that. Uh, let's get on with the actual uh, the actual overview. We'll kick into the overview. So overview, build, test, uh, B roll, and conclusion at the end. Stick around for that if you want to know my absolute core thoughts on the pros, cons, and the missed opportunities of this case. Thanks for watching. If you want to support this channel in any way, look to the end of the video and I'll explain there. So, I'll catch you in a second. Bye-bye. As discussed, the Kolink Satellite pretends to be a micro ATX case, but better suits a mini ITX board with little to no drawbacks. It comes in a cardboard box with polystyrene packaging and is wrapped in a plastic bag. Removing all the packaging reveals something really rather interesting. This case instantly gives off vibes of a living room media center or a small business system. There's no particular gamer style about this case, especially the gold feet. Speaking of which, the gold part is plastic, which is no surprise, but where you'd expect to see some foam for the feet in a typical budget fashion, you're met with large circular rubber pads, and in my opinion, that's the right way around to do it. Taking a step back, there's not a lot more to be seen at the base of the case, just a grip-like hole to the underside of the front panel, and there are a couple of slits which will come into play later. To the side of the case is a grill for ventilation, and when I say to the side, that's an ambiguous term since there's more than one side of course, but in this case it really doesn't matter since in perfect symmetry, there's an opposing grill to the other side. Heading up to the top, we catch another glimpse of that eye-catching bold front grille. And up top, we find the front I.O. and yet another vent. For such a small case, a lot of the area has been dedicated to ventilation. This should help substantially with performance during the thermal testing later. But let's take a quick step back and check out the front I.O. Up here we have your power and drive activity LEDs, two USB 3.0 ports, separate microphone and headphone jacks, and the reset and power buttons. It's a pretty good layout all things considered, but for some reason I would have liked to see the I.O. on the side. This could have led to having a lower I.O. on one side or a higher I.O. on the other, depending on which way you flip the front panel. To the rear again, there's plenty of ventilation area. To the top left is the power supply unit pass-through cable. To the center is the position for the 120mm fan with an included 1200rpm fan. And of course to the bottom is the rear I.O. position, which I love since the majority of wires in most builds end up going downwards. Perhaps the power supply unit pass-through could have been lowered to suit this style. And yes, no tramp stamps to be seen here, fully removable and replaceable PCI Express slot covers to the rear. Now this is interesting on a couple of levels. First level is that this is such a budget case, you just expect snap-off panels as just a standard. But they're not, and that's really surprising, and it's nice to see, I and mean, it's a surprise to me, hence why I'm bringing it up. Uh, I mean, the Cooler Master Q300L actually had quite a few snap-off uh, panels to the rear, uh, and this has got two replaceable ones, so quite interesting. And then this idiot proceeded to talk about how this is a mini the ITX case since a micro ATX motherboard wouldn't fit. Did you not hear about the 18 compatible micro ATX motherboards from the latest three LGA1151 chipset generations back as far as the B150 and every AM4 chipset? Considering there's 119 micro ATX motherboards being sold in the UK, that's compatibility with over 15% of the motherboards available. And then this chump, this pretender, tries to argue this case should be called a mini ITX case with partial micro ATX compatibility and claims there's little to no benefit to putting a micro ATX board in here with only two PCI Express slots available. The damn fool, don't you even know what modding is? Anyway, let's move on checking out the inside of the case. Opening up this rather surprising and in many respects confusing case requires the removal of four thumbscrews to the rear. This releases a single panel that wraps from one side over the top to the other, and sliding it towards the rear allows it to be lifted up and away. This isn't the easiest panel to remove and replace, but it's by no means very difficult. 
This panel itself is understandably very flimsy, and this is somewhat intentional so it can be more easily removed and replaced, which is obvious by the cuts to the corners at the rear. But it's worth mentioning it so you can make sure you keep it safe and secure while building in your system. Inside this overarching panel are plastic mesh filters that are lightly mechanically held against the grills. If you're looking for the best performance out of this case then you could remove these, but for the purposes of this review they are staying in place. So with the top off we're looking at a far more accessible chassis, but to get the best look available we've still got a few things to remove. The top panel is one of two drive storage brackets which can be removed after taking out four screws, which also happens to hold the accessories back. This drive mounted to this panel will also hang over the CPU cooler, so the maximum CPU cooler height you can fit inside this case will be the maximum 165mm minus whatever thickness of drive you place up here. The other drive bracket can be found to the side of the case. This one again can be removed by taking out four screws. Two can be found up top and then the other two can be found at the bottom. The drives mounted to this panel will overhang the motherboard VRM, but there are other limitations which we'll check out during drive installation later. As for the inside of the case, there's not a lot that hasn't been mentioned already, but something I did fail to mention earlier are the snap-off covers for water-cooled tubing holes to the top left. And that the included fan is a 3-pin fan to allow for fan speed control, or if you want it at full speed all of the time, you can power it via the 4-pin Molex connector. As for the front, well it's just ventilation space here and that's it. The 120mm fan position mentioned earlier is exactly what I meant, the fan position. There's only one in this case. You could potentially mod a couple to the front panel and a couple to the side perhaps, so there's potentially some simple room for improvement. Now the front panel doesn't need removing at all to build a system in this case, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't explore further. You'd instinctively just pull on the handle like cut out to the bottom of the front panel, right? Well, in reality, the plastic clips to the inside of the case are really rather strong, so my recommendation would be to pinch the clips from the inside and then pull the front panel off. Something that really puzzled me was the mild steel ring that had the audio cable looping through it. It's not magnetic itself, I'm just using a magnetic screwdriver to prove it's some sort of mild steel. Now I don't know a lot about audio setups, but there, is there any benefit to having an audio cable running through a mild steel ring? If you know, please educate me in the comments. Something that I found a little funny was the grounding wire from the front IO PCB to the chassis. Now it's nothing about this setup that I found funny, but it reminded me of the Inwin 301 grounding wire that linked the front PCB to a part of the chassis that was actually going out of its way to connect to the chassis, which in turn was running through the cable management area. This case does it better, and I like that there's plenty of slack to remove the panel. Now for the brackets and accessories bag. Starting with the accessories bag, there's a lot to run through. From right to left, we have the user manual, some zip ties, 16 drive screw grommets, 8 2.5 inch drive screws, 8 3.5 inch drive screws, 2 fan screws, I guess they're probably spares, 5 power supply unit screws, I guess another spare added to the 4, and 5 motherboard screws, again one more spare. Then there's a couple of audio jack plugs, and then heading to the other side, there's also a couple of USB plugs. I presume this is for the home theatre style setup so that it'll be stuck in a cupboard or something for months on end gathering dust. There's also a motherboard speaker included. Now if you don't know much about motherboard speakers, to put it lightly, they can be extremely handy when diagnosing problems with your system. Easy debug LEDs can only provide so much information. Heading back to the user manual very briefly, there's a few things to be pointed out. Looking down at the specifications section, we see features such as radiation protection. Does this mean heat treated or protection from countless sources of radiation? We also see mini ITX motherboard compatible with no mention of micro ATX support, but looking further down still, we see mainboard support listed as micro ATX and mini ITX. Is Colink even sure itself? And then I came across the term life expectancy and a figure of 5 years. What does that term even mean? Well, talking to the supplier of the case, they told me that Overclockers UK are the source of Colink cases, and this was later confirmed to me by Overclockers UK on the phone. Now, if Overclockers UK is watching, they know I record all the conversations I have with them, so if they want to dispute this, I will gladly make the calls public in the public's interest. It's also worth mentioning that they couldn't have been less helpful in trying to find any information about this case. 
When I asked their technical department what Micro ATX board fitted inside this case, I was met with, I've built over 2000 systems, I know a Micro ATX board fits in that case, but I don't know which one. That's a hell of a technical department you've got there Overclockers UK. Anyway, according to them, the life expectancy figure is just a random figure they feel customers should think about replacing their hardware, based on nothing in particular. Overclockers UK told me the warranty is actually 3 years, which to be fair is a decent warranty, but it's not mentioned here. On a final note about Overclockers UK here, if you have a Colink case and you have a problem or a question, call Overclockers UK. They are the customer support for Colink, not that they would mention it in any of the user manuals, any number or any contact information of any sort. So Overclockers UK should be your source for questions. As for the two panels we removed from the case earlier, these are the only mounts for any drives, but they provide a pretty big offering. Now I only have two 3.5 inch hard disk drives, so with a little camera trickery, here's a little representation of the maximum three 3.5 inch drives you can fit in this case. And if you're anything like me and you love the 2.5 inch drive form factor, here's how a representation of the maximum four 2.5 inch drive capacity for this case looks. Again, I only have two nice looking 2.5 inch drives, so more camera trickery here. This is some excellent drive storage compatibility, and come to think of it, all cube style cases I've worked with achieve this really well. So I wanted to have a quick conversation about the power supply unit and the cooling in general in the system. Also, as a little note to the build quality. Yeah, that's showing itself when the case is completely empty. It wasn't like that when the, uh, the chassis panel, side panels were on. So we'll see what it's like when the system's built inside, but Anyway, so in terms of cooling and ventilation, uh, you can fit an ATX power supply in here. Uh, you can see that this zone here is very much uh, purely for an ATX power supply unit. So if we put one in, you can see that it takes up that entire ventilation zone to the front. And you also notice that these grooves that are cut out of the bottom are for holding the power supply unit in place, at least an ATX power supply unit. And I was actually surprised. Um, I, I find that quite an interesting feature. I think it's quite an interesting way of being able to hold the power supply unit in position, but they're not exactly the smoothest edges. So if you've got a bit more of a delicate, glossy, or smooth finish to your power supply unit, then you might want to be a bit careful of that. Uh, this is quite a rough finish to this. I quite like this for a cheaper power supply unit because it means you can throw it about a bit more and it, you don't have to be too concerned. So anyway, in terms of cooling then, let's say with your 160 millimeter power supply unit, we're gonna be looking at, for the CPU, uh, there's gonna be basically nothing from the front. There is a small ventilation strip here, but the GPU is gonna be basically covering that or taking quite a lot of that. So very minimal airflow from the front for the CPU and the VRM for the motherboard and the RAM. So you're going to be uh, predominantly relying on the ventilation strip to the rear, uh, to the side here, and then the uh, the fan to the rear that's pulling it through in sort of 90 degree phase across that zone there. So you might want to perhaps remove the filter from the inside of the panel there. I think that would make a lot of sense in a case like this uh, because it's so tight and crammed. Generally, I think filtering in a case like this is completely ridiculous. Uh, well, it's not ridiculous, of course, you get rid of the dust, but in all honesty, the dust is not going to cause any problems. No near as much as the lack of cooling would. So uh, so anyway, uh, if we look at the power supply unit at the front then, you can see it's completely covered with the ventilation. Uh, it's getting the best cooling out of any component in this case by far but we could potentially improve the situation. Now, just before we move on to the improved power supply unit situation, the graphics card is a little bit of a tight fit, or in fact, I would say a non-starter in a case like this. So if I put this graphics card, say, in line with how it would fit if it was in its slot in this position here, through that place there, then you can see that the profile is pretty much just killing the ability to be able to, well, get the wires or the cables out of the back of the power supply unit. It's completely lined through. There is no way that you would possibly be able to have this graphics card in here with those cables coming out the back there and the ventilation would be completely cut off from the rear anyway. So if you wanted to go for a, um, a full size graphics card, then you're probably gonna want to go for something less than 140 millimeters uh, deep so you can just bend those out of the way just about uh, or even smaller. Or if you wanted to go for a full size power supply unit and you wanted to get a mini ITX graphics card or something smaller, go for something that's 200 millimeters smaller or ideally 180 millimeters long or smaller. Uh, 200 you could push it and might be able to just about get those cables 
over the top and towards all the components they need to get to. Another setup idea which was actually pointed out to me with a little conversation with the Sickness1234, a very loyal subscriber to the channel, he was saying that you could potentially flip this power supply unit the other way round and use it as an exhaust for the system and flip this fan the other way round and have that as an intake. So you're bringing uh, cool air over the CPU cooler towards the VRM area there and then you're exhausting it out of the side using the power supply unit and then the uh, GPU is basically its own ecosystem over there with its own intake here and exhaust to the rear or well to the front and the rear so that's a really interesting thought but I think something that I would more recommend in a case like this is giving yourself more free area full stop now that I think if you're going for an ATX power supply unit or that's all you've got your hands on then that flipping it over would probably be an excellent idea and I think probably the best of having an ATX power supply unit in this case but here's what I would recommend an SFX power supply unit. That is the uh, type of power supply unit. So it's the uh, form factor of the power supply unit. Uh, this is designed for basically mini ITX cases, really compact cases. This uh, is a Corsair SF600. It's only 100 millimeters deep and it is way thinner and smaller in terms of its height as well than a, a standard ATX power supply unit. It packs 600 watts of power. Pretty much most systems with a single graphics card, even potentially up to Threadripper, you could run on this GPU or the GPU, this power supply unit PSU, uh, and you wouldn't have a problem. Now this gives you perhaps a better option than having an ATX power supply unit in any orientation because it sits quite comfortably over here. It presses against the front, which means it, it gets its clean supply of air from the front vent. And it also allows a strip, a perimeter around the front and the sides, which you can see if I put my hand back here, to allow cool air to run through and get to your, uh, to get to your uh, power supply. <laughs> get your motherboard, VRM, and your CPU. And it gives you a lot more room inside to route cables and put, I know, fan hubs, and all that sort of stuff that you want to place in. So I'm gonna be progressing with this 100 millimeter deep uh, power supply unit, and hopefully this will give me a lot more room, I'll be a lot more comfortable, and an extra benefit to a, uh, a small form factor SFX power supply unit like this is that the cables are designed for mini ITX cases. They are, they're not full ATX length cables. So compare the cables on this power supply unit with the cables on this power supply unit. Uh, there you go. You can see, well, not very well. You can see that the distances is are actually ridiculously much longer. So you're looking at pretty much twice the length cables on your average ATX power supply unit. So yes. Small form factor all the way. As for installing this SFX form factor power supply unit, if you're going to do the same in whatever case you get, you're most likely going to need to pick up an SFX to ATX adapter bracket, which you can see attached here to the Corsair SF600. The one I'm using is the Silverstone PP08 SFX to ATX adapter bracket, and I can thoroughly recommend it to anyone who's on the market for one. I had to use a slightly more slender screwdriver than usual to install the screws to fix the power supply unit in place, but it's a small mini ITX case, so what can you really expect? But once the screws are all in place, we just need to hook up the power extension cable from the rear and we're all done. Remember to switch your power supply unit on before you close up the case at the end, but it's not a bad idea to start the system off the first time with the side and top panel off in case there's an issue to be diagnosed. Now we're ready to move on to installing the motherboard. You won't be able to install the CPU cooler after the motherboard in place, not unless you're going for a pushpin cooler, so you'll want to install that first, but RAM you can leave till later, and it is kind of recommended since it gives you a little more room to link up all the connectors to the motherboard afterwards. So a quick rundown of the test system, the motherboard is the Asus Z170i Pro Gaming ITX motherboard. As mentioned earlier, there aren't that many decent micro ATX motherboard options available. In the socket we've got an i7-6700K 91W processor at 4GHz and 1.2V, which is being cooled by a Noctua NHL9i with our custom painted NFA9X14 fan, which has been tested and has no performance loss compared to the original whatsoever. I know having such a small cooler is a strange thing for such a high power processor, but this is a test system designed for compatibility over performance so we can compare the biggest and smallest cases during testing. And last but not least, we've got two 8 gig sticks of 2133MHz G-Skills Rip Jaws 5 for a total of 16GB. 
So popping the motherboard in was a bit of a squeeze. If you're going for an ATX power supply unit, then you'd want to install the motherboard first. There are only four fixed motherboard standoffs without the option for installing more, which makes the thought of installing a micro ATX motherboard even dodgier, since small micro ATX motherboards generally require six standoffs. They're only simple standoffs, not standoff posts, so they won't hold your motherboard in place while you fix the screws, but this is a budget case so it's hardly a negative. Once it's fixed in position, we can link up the power to the motherboard and CPU and move on to linking up the fans. On this motherboard there are two fan headers to the top left, so there's a fair amount of excess wire to be used up elsewhere. And if you really wanted to get rid of that Molex connector, you could just cut it off and seal the ends off separately. As for the SATA connectors, my intention was to go for four 2.5 inch drives, but for reasons we'll get into later that wasn't quite possible. This is the last chance we're going to have some decent access to the motherboard, since adding the drive brackets and graphics card will seal off a lot of the system, so replacing the front panel is the logical next step. Remember you don't need to remove it in the first place, but I just did it so we can find out what was behind. With all the power supply unit cables pre-connected, manoeuvrability is significantly reduced, so connecting the front I.O. was a little difficult. The reason they're all pre-connected here is that the connectors are very stiff, so it's just easier to connect them outside of the case first. With the audio and USB 3.0 connectors in place, next is the switch and LED cluster. It may be worth connecting the front I.O. first before the motherboard is installed since this was a pain to access and can easily be done before the motherboard is fixed in place. Next up are the drives. The side bracket which you can see here is where the hard disk drives are being placed. This is where all the rubber grommets go which we saw earlier which will help to create a stable vibration absorbing mount. As for the top bracket, you'll need to get your own 2.5 inch drive screws for this one, you don't get them in the box. You could get away with 2 each, but we'll go for 4 each just to reduce negative comments. Installing the side drive mounting bracket presents the 14mm 2.5 inch drive top slot incompatibility, so I swapped the drive positions around, which just about worked with the CPU power connector on the motherboard. After replacing the screws to the side drive mounting bracket, which serves as an excellent cross brace to the chassis, we needed to take a quick look at the power supply unit position. After a quick lineup of the top drive bracket, it turned out I needed just a few more millimeters of length on the SATA power connector, so since I can't stretch the cable, I decided to move the power supply unit inwards by rotating the SFX to ATX adapter bracket, which seemed to fix the problem. But before we can install the top drive mounting bracket, we need to install the graphics card. So heading around to the back, we needed to remove this top slot cover screw cover, which actually couldn't be replaced later since one of the clips clashed with the frame of the graphics card. And with all that removed and the following screws and covers freed, it's time for a long-winded and painful time lapse of trying to install a 267mm graphics card into a case that can supposedly support a 280mm long graphics card. Let's just say I went through quite a few different techniques over the course of about 20 minutes to try and get this to fit. After unscrewing the fan to free up room around the rear PCI Express slots, it wasn't enough. So then I tried removing all of the power connectors from the power supply unit, which again wasn't enough. So then the RAM, SATA connectors and USB 3.0 connector all needed removing as a last ditch attempt before resorting to getting the pliers out like on the Corsair Air 240. Luckily that wasn't required since with a little scuffing here and there I was able to install the card. There's absolutely no way that a 280mm card can fit in this case without modding. I've got only 3mm of space to the rear of this card, so if you trust me and you're getting this case, get a card that's 267mm or smaller and expect some scraping at the 267mm range. So after reinstalling the system after the graphics card installation, I'd like to point out the sheer amount of space in front of the graphics card's fans. I think Colink should ditch the idea that this case and future cases like this are micro ATX cases. There isn't actually full official support for micro ATX boards. Then they could reduce the width of the case by a good 3cm and advertise this as a really solid ITX case that I'd have very little to criticise. So moving on to the top drive bracket, now after a lot of configuration issues with the drives, none of which are the fault of this case, I had to settle for installing one drive up top and two drives to the side of the case. So you'll notice that the 14mm drive has gone, which is only my backup for all the drives in the case now, so it's not essential for the everyday running of this system. 
You'll notice that even though I wanted to install another drive into the other slot of the top bracket, the SATA power connector couldn't reach it. This could have been resolved if Corsair included a second SATA power connector with their SF600, but they didn't, so compromises had to be made. So there we have it, a completely built system in the Colink satellite. All that's left to do now is to test it and see how it copes with this test system. This is a long segment now, there's a lot of testing data to go through, so if you really want to know everything, stick around for the long haul. First, we're just going to quickly go over all the testing setups and methodology. Now, initially I tested the system with the stock rear fan in an exhaust setup, but I also tested the system with a stock fan as an intake. Remember I mentioned earlier how the power supply unit could be used as an exhaust? Well that didn't happen since it was so crammed in and I'd be buggered if I had to get the graphics card out to rotate the power supply unit, but that's not really such a big problem since there's more than enough free ventilation area for the air to escape from one intake fan and the power supply unit can be somewhat indirectly used as an exhaust. I also changed out the standard 1200 RPM fan for a faster 2200 RPM EK Varda F4120ER. I tested this in both exhaust and intake configurations. To avoid dragging out all of the stats, we'll just initially cover the 10 minute Pram95 and Furmark as it comes and Max Fan's test results in both intake and exhaust configurations directly first, and then we'll lock down the optimal configuration and roll out the rest of the synthetic and gaming benchmark results. Before we move on, it's worth pointing out that the thermal test results are in a delta T format, meaning the ambient temperature of the room is subtracted from the temperature of the individual component. This means that we can compare and contrast thermal test results of all cases on a level playing field, but things get a little murky when it comes to thermal throttling. For this test specifically, I needed to test as close to the ambient temperature as possible to even out the playing field due to the thermal throttling and downclocking. And finally, all tests are performed at maximum fan speed on GPU, CPU and case fans to remove fan curve variables, and you can take an educated guess as to how much worse the results would be at lower fan speeds. So as for the stock 1200rpm fan, comparing the intake and exhaust results shows us that the intake configuration leaves the GPU 7 degrees hotter than the exhaust configuration indicated by the green bars. And as for the CPU temps indicated by the blue bars, in both configurations the CPU thermal throttled represented by the fade to red. But how much did the CPU thermal throttle in each situation? Well taking a look at the clock speed chart shows us that while the GPU was 7 degrees cooler in the exhaust configuration, it was at the expense of the CPU temperature which caused thermal throttling from 4GHz all the way down to 3.11GHz. It's also worth pointing out that the 7 degrees difference didn't really provide much of an advantage for the GPU which only clocked 20MHz higher in the exhaust configuration. Bear in mind that this test is as bad as it gets, but it's a clear indication that with the stock fan you'd be better off going for an intake configuration, not the stock exhaust configuration. So what happened when we threw the faster 2200 RPM fan in for the max fan test? Well this is where things got a little strange. In both configurations the CPU thermal throttled and the graphics card seemed to top out at the same temperature. So that seems a little strange, but it gets weirder when you look at the clocks and see that the CPU thermal throttles to the same degree and the GPU clocks down by the same degree in both configurations. So this leads me to believe that the brute force airflow either way mixes the air rather than extract extracts the heat from both the CPU and GPU in a similar fashion. This could also be seen as an issue with the style of CPU cooler of this system. Having the heatsink so low down from the mainstream of airflow means the faster airflow doesn't directly impact the CPU's cooling strategy, so there's an opportunity to go for a much higher tower cooler and reap the benefits of a faster fan. So we're going to stick to the intake configuration for the rest of the tests since on the whole it was the better performer. Let's get on to the massive comparison graphs and see how this case stacks up compared to a few others. We're going to flip back and forth between the as it comes stock fan test results and the max fans fast as fans test results and see the potential improvements for each test. We'll start with Prime95 and the Furmark 10 minute torture test, the most power hungry and thermally demanding test we do. Just a couple of extra rules to throw down, the graphs are set in order of case size from left to right, which is represented by the purple bar in litres. This can be helpful to spot cases that perform particularly well or poorly despite their size. And all the way to the left is the test bench, which is hypothetically the target best case scenario. It's also worth pointing out that with the massive information on the screen now and later, it's best focusing on individual colours that represent each test value, and scanning across the graph to digest the data. 
So to no surprise, the satellite is outperforming the CR280 in GPU thermals, but has fallen a little short of beating the Q300L. But to check out the CPU situation, we need to head over to the clocks graphs. But before we do that, how did the higher speed fan help the situation? Well, as we saw before, it didn't do a lot for the satellite. The GPU was slightly cooler, but not by a lot. However, it was still cooler than the CR280, so that's not too bad. Heading back to the stock fan and checking out the clocks during the Prime 95 in combustor test, the CR280 is outperforming the satellite by 100 MHz, but everything crushes the Q300L. The single 1000 RPM fan of the Q300L in that size of a case just wasn't enough to direct the airflow effectively. Changing the fan out didn't really make the world spin any faster. You can see the same thing happen for the CR280 with regards to the CPU. But whereas with the CR280, the CPU traded clock speed of the CPU with the GPU, the satellite doesn't get the same treatment here. Bear in mind, however, since this is a load of thermal throttling and downclocking going on here, it's all very ambient temperature sensitive. Moving on to a synthetic graphics-based benchmark, Unigen Superposition shows us that the stock fan is pushing the satellite ahead of both the CR280 and the Q300L for both CPU and GPU thermals. You might have also noticed the orange bar that's appeared. This represents frames per second for all following graphs. For something that's half the size of the Q300L, this case is doing pretty damn well. Adding the faster fan shows us that the GPU is very much dependent on its own fans to cool it on its own side of the case, and the faster fan only benefits the CPU. Clearly the lesser demanding thermals of this test, coupled with the more direct airflow channel seems to be doing an excellent job. Same goes for Unigen Heaven. The satellite has a slightly better thermals than the CR280 and Q300L on CPU and GPU temps, but with the faster fan added to it, it would appear that some of the heat of the CPU is being transferred over to the GPU. Maybe this is a scenario where turning the power supply unit around and having a more effective exhaust might come in handy. So let's get on to some gaming benchmarks. Starting off with a fairly light title, Dirt 3 reinforces that the stock fan provides a better cooling performance than the two cases above it, and taking the CPU thermals into account individually, it's outperforming the Mastercase Pro 3, a case nearly three and a half times bigger. Again, changing the fan out for a faster one shows an improvement in CPU thermals, but bears little to no benefit for GPU thermals, which sees all other cases outperforming the satellite in that regard. Turning up the heat a little, Hitman reiterates that the satellite is a solid stock performer, but there's little benefit to adding a fan that's nearly twice as fast. Interestingly, in Rise of the Tomb Raider, the satellite starts with the lead on the CR280 and the Q300L, but this time manages to maintain the lead with a noticeable improvement in the CPU as well as the GPU temps. And finally, we end on Grand Theft Auto 5, where the satellite falls right in between the CR280 and Q300L for CPU temps, but takes the lead on GPU temps with the stock fan. But after replacing it for a faster 2200 RPM fan, the CPU temps still fall between the two larger cases, but at the expense of the GPU receiving a thermal penalty as the CPU temps appear to be transferred somewhat from the GPU's cooling zone.
So there we have it, we're pretty much coming to the end of the review, just the pros, cons, and missed opportunities to go through. I think, for just as a basic overview of my opinions, it's not bad. For £25-£30, there's not a lot to go wrong, really. Uh, you can't really lose that much value for your money uh, on, with something as simple uh, as it gets, and this is relatively so, but I suppose there's extra removable panels if you want them, but I would probably recommend having them regardless for rigidity purposes. Um, but yeah, so let's go over the pros, cons, and missed opportunities. We'll start with pros, we'll start with something nice. So, uh, solid stock thermal. So that, that fan, that 1200 RPM fan at the rear, um, was pretty solid. I've seen some, uh, some customer reviews saying that it's really loud. I don't think it's all that loud. I mean, it's running now. I'm, I've got pretty much everything I have to edit my videos open, and it's all in the background ready to go, and... I mean, the mic is right next to me here. It's it's more directional to, to my sort of, uh, well, it's more directional to my voice at the moment, but, I mean, it does pick up ambient sound, and you can't really hear a lot of it, so that's not too bad. But, yeah, solid stock thermals, you don't, I wouldn't really, rec uh, I wouldn't really say it's necessary to change that out for a high-performance fan. It's a clean style. I like the style. I think it's very tidy. I think it won't look too out of shape uh, next to your TV or something like that. Um, but, yeah, really cheap, really affordable way of getting quite a clean style. Uh, it's got large component compatibility so uh, all of the drives I mean that's pretty solid getting yourself three three and a half inch hard disk drives or a uh, uh a four two and a half inch drives uh, you know SSDs or two and a half inch um, uh, hard disk drives so you can go for you know four terabyte drives all over and you've got yourself you know 16 terabytes of storage here although of course the one at the top here doesn't work so SSD here and then you know three four terabyte drives doesn't sound too bad to me uh, but you, again you can go for the um, two uh, three and a half terabyte ones three and a half inch um, so eight or twelve terabyte ones at the top again it, the sky's the limit in a, in a sense. Um, but anyway, uh, the CPU cooler as well, I want to mention that. Um, although the CPU cooler I use is purely for compatibility reasons with other cases, the test system needs to remain the same to, uh, re to um, maintain it as a fair test principle. So, uh, so a really low profile CPU cooler we used here, but again, up to 165 millimeters, that's really not that bad. You can throw pretty much some of the largest coolers on the market in here and you will get the benefit from that. Uh, but then again you might want to perhaps think about changing this rear fan because it might be bottlenecking perhaps the higher speed fans on your CPU cooler. Um, so large rubber feet, I thought that was a nice bonus uh, and the re removable and replaceable piece of express slot covers, nothing too big, it's up to you whether what I say here is a big deal or not, um, It's it's I'm really not enfor uh, enforcing or forcing my uh, my opinions onto you uh, and yeah I think that's pretty much it for the, uh, for the pros. Moving on to cons, the Micro ATX label I have an issue with. I, I think it really should be predominantly marketed as a mini ITX case, but I know to make more money, if you market it as the larger one and people assume it will be uh, it'll be so, then most consumers probably looking to make a little home theater system or something, I mean, potentially they might not even be aware that there are lots of different sizes of Micro ATX motherboards around. Uh, and that's just irritating to me. I saw a review actually uh, that, said, um, that said that they struggled to fit theirs in, so they went with something else and they didn't seem to have uh, any issues uh, or they didn't take up any issue with uh, Colink on this situation. So, so they might have thought it was their, their fault, but really it's not. Uh, very low micro ATX motherboard support. Like I said, 18 out of 119 boards across the LGA uh, 1151 past three generations and all a AM4. Um, uh, all of the chipsets on the AM4 socket, um, so that's really a big disappointment, that's um, just over 15% of the market, that's pretty poor, so yeah, that micro ATX label connection, not so good. It only has two PCI Express slot covers, I would have liked to see three, there's space for a third one, and that would be able to utilize uh, some of these uh, boards that are compatible, have three slots available. Add a third slot, it wouldn't make really much of a difference to the construction, it would be absolutely fine, but that's just a, a, um, a poor design. Um, four standoffs, not six, again, most of the boards supported in this case uh, require six standoffs, really, they require six standoffs, you know, physically it will work with four, but really the six is what you want, especially if you're trying to utilize two slots rather than just a singular one, closest to the top. Uh, and bear in mind as well, on some of them, the 16x rail is actually the second slot, which wouldn't work with this. So uh, that's something really important to point out. Um, another con, customer support. Overclockers UK, uh, the customer support is is a joke, to be honest. Uh, the technical department are very uh, boisterous, I'd say. And they seem to want to sort of aggressively push their experience and say, well, I've done 2,000 systems, so I know everything. Only, only I can't remember what the board was that... I'll put in there. So if you really want to go down that road overclockers UK, fair enough. But I think 
pretty much everyone I've talked to, uh, at least in my comment sections uh, about Overclockers UK, uh, have mentioned uh, that the customer support is bad. They'd never, nobody's ever mentioned good customer support. Let's put it that way. It was okay for me up until this last few months. Uh, funny enough. Um, so anyway, difficult to get questions answered. Didn't really get many. Uh, actually had to go to the sales guide to actually understand one of the boards they they used. Um, but they, they'd only tell me that. No specific details about it. I looked that up myself. Um, the 280 millimeter graphics card compatibility. Um, although technically it measures 280 millimeters, that generally um, graphics card manufacturers don't measure tip to tip. They sort of have a, um, a, a central zone. Um, so although this card is sort of heading to the 270 zone uh, in terms of its length, I really wouldn't recommend much more than that because scraping will happen. Uh, and if you really want to go to 280, then I literally can't see a way you could fit it in. You'd have to bend the chassis. You'd have to be. It'd have to be the first input component you install. I've heard people uh, when I said uh, there were issues with installing graphics card or shown there were issues with installing graphics card saying well you should have taxed the graphics card to the motherboard first and then install the motherboard CPU cooler CPU RAM all attached to the motherboard in one go I don't recommend that I recommend you go for a smaller graphics card or just get a different case I mean there's loads of cases around and lots of plenty uh, plenty as good as this uh, if not better in some respects and yeah, that's pretty much it. So it would have been nice to see uh, some sort of cutout, which moving on to the missed opportunities, cutout is on there, but we'll start from the top. Um, more fan positions, side ones are a minor point. I'd like to see a couple in the front though. That would be a really good opportunity to put a few, a couple in the front, much like the Coling Sanctuary. Uh, two of the front would be quite a, a, an interesting addition. They could attach to the chassis, but they would have to attach from the inside, which is the only gripe that would, uh, would occur if you were to do it here. I don't see a very effective way or clean way of attaching them to the front uh, through the front and then uh, attaching the front to the the chassis so it might be a little difficult uh, perhaps to the sides but again a clean way of doing it is very difficult um, third PCI Express slot to make more use of a micro ATX board like I mentioned uh, I think I mentioned before that the I really would prefer to have this as a reduced width case so make it three centimeters which would be the the amount that you could lose off this side alone not including this side um, so you could lose three centimeters on the width make it slightly smaller make it a, a more appealing mini ATX uh, case than rather than a, a micro ATX case which doesn't really work uh, in nearly 85% of situations. Uh, and then a cutout for the GPU installation, like I mentioned before, cutout for GP, GPU installation should be pretty standard, to be honest. It's it's there on a lot of the other different cases. Really a cutout from the top of the chassis, uh, the front and back would, would be a great addition, um, and that would make in installing that a direct, you know, vertical installation rather than trying to squeeze it in sidewards to get that 280mm supported graphics card in. And then the lower power supply unit connection, uh, the power supply unit connection could be lowered down to to go along with the theme and the style with the with the motherboard um, I.O. being so close to the back and the bottom. That would be more ideal. So that's pretty much uh, what I've got. I'm going to close the book on that. Try and not make the uh, mic bump like I did in the intro. I'm very sorry about that. I will be working on trying to find some sort of usable uh, way of attaching some sort of mic. It might have to be like a high boom or something like that because I move around this case and constantly change direction. So I'll work on that. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for checking this video out. If you want to support this channel in any way, uh, a like would, would be fantastic if you like the video. And if you dislike the video, please let me know in the comments. Uh, and if you like the video, again, uh, let me know what you liked and let me know what you didn't like so I can improve them for future videos. Talking fast might be an issue as well. Uh, I generally do that a little bit too much. It gets away from me. Um, in terms of other support uh, or just chatting with me, you can chat with me in the comments uh, or go over to Facebook. That would be fantastic. If you want to support the channel directly, financially, if you want to, financially, doesn't make much sense because it is financially then you can always join the patreon and add a dollar or so whatever amount you feel comfortable with uh, just to support getting cases selling them things like that just to recuperate the losses although we are um, remonetized now that is recuperating a lot of the losses but again any extra additional support from you guys means that I can go bigger and bolder with the way I record things and what I record uh, and just as a side note if you want to purchase this case uh, then you can go to the Amazon links in the video description uh, and those are the affiliate links for this channel and you can purchase it from there so so thank you very much for checking this video out and I will catch you in the next video which will be the Silverstone RVZ03 Raven uh, Mini ITX case which I was supposed to be doing a review on before this one but one of the components broke so I had to have, have them ship that out to me and that will be an interesting enough review uh, just based on that experience. So uh, I will catch you in that one. Thank you very much guys. See you then.